What's up, everyone, everyone, everyone? Coast to Coast Podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. I'm Joey Powell, your host, and we are brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt. Fellas, I am glad you are here. It is October, which feels so weird to say. Uh, I know it seems like just yesterday the Tar Heels basketball team lost to Virginia in the ACC tournament, and then everything went away. And thankfully, Sean Moran and Cheryl McMillan have been with us the entire way to look at roster analysis because there's been just a major overhaul with who's in the Tar Heel locker room. And here we are in October with this is the month the season starts. There is actually an exhibition game. Uh, There will be a secret scrimmage. There's all kinds of like real basketball stuff happening now. So with that being said, October 1st, as we are recording this, Coast to Coast Podcast, bringing in the two guys you're here to see, Sean Moran, Sherelle McMillan. Boy, I'm glad you're here. Let's start with some recruiting stuff. Uh, there's a lot going on recruiting-wise because, you know, as as basketball picks up, you know not only is the coaching staff, Hubert Davis and company, uh, training their new guys and getting their new guys kind of into shape, they're still out trying to figure out who's going to be on the roster next year. And the first name that comes to mind, Sean, you did a great video right up of this young man, uh, Sherelle, you've also kind of hinted at how the, the recruitment started, but Caleb Wilson, uh, number four ranked player in the 2025 class, a six nine four out of the Atlanta area. Sean, I want to give you the chance to talk first about, you know, your video breakdown and what have you seen out of Caleb Wilson and how do you think he, uh, how do you think he might project to the next level? Yeah. For, first off, there wasn't anything in terms of, a. a immediate commitment that that we were doing the the video it was more um you know knowing that he he had scheduled a visit in november uh not to mention just trying to start analyzing some of these top 10 guys with 2025 offers a little bit more but for Caleb wilson i think definitely one of the more intriguing prospects just given his size um and and at six eight and a half with shoes on uh how he likes to play uh when, when you're watching him he is on the perimeter. Uh, definitely models himself as, as you know the Kevin Durant style on, on the wing. Um, you know, I think when you're looking at stats and diving into the film, because he he played on the Georgia Stars Nike EYBL team, uh, did not they did not fare fare well. Uh, so they, they didn't didn't make it to Peach Jam. Um, so you, you kind of want to dive dive in a little bit more. I know Sherlock got to see him in person way back in the the first live period go against Drake Powell, but offensively when you look at the numbers he shot uh just around 20 percent from the three-point line so that was a little bit concerning in terms of that that number but i think when when you're able to dive in uh just on the straight catch and shoot three pointers he was around 40 percent. it wasn't a high high sample size but that at least showed uh promise uh good looking form close to 70 percent from the free throw line so i think from a shooting sample size you know shooting percentage size that's going to be something to track going forward. Uh, what type of, what is, how is he, what type of shots is he taking? Um, and how is he improving from that point in time? Because if he wants to be a perimeter threat, you know, people aren't going to play him like that until he, until he proves it. But I think very, very versatile um, in terms of being able to put the ball on the floor, get to the rim, definitely more comfortable driving uh, with his left hand. Um, he's a natural righty. So doesn't get the greatest lift uh, when he gets into traffic. So you can see tough shots, contested shots, maybe not getting all the way to the basket at times. But when he's going left, very comfortable with a pull-up, using that size that it's really really challenging to block his shot. Um, you can contest it, but he can he can get it off, um, not to mention a, a nice step back that he has. So a lot of guard skills for a big, you know, a guy his size, which I think shows that ceiling and that number four ranking uh the question will be you know how does he start to put that together a little bit more uh as he continues to progress throughout the high school seasons and obviously we'll continue to to talk about those things that sean mentioned uh as unc's recruitment of of caleb wilson materializes uh should it take further steps and there will be more to talk about you know as he gets closer to his visit i'm sure Cheryl, you want to, I guess, recap for everybody what the the offer situation looked like uh, and how Caleb Wilson got on the Tar Heels radar? Uh, yeah, really, from the start of uh, July, they were kind of in on him. Uh, we'd heard the name before, but he had a game, I think, the first night of the first period in April, and UNC was there watching. And then, of course, he played Drake Powell the next day, so UNC was there watching. 
and then pretty much they followed him throughout the summer. Um, just a player that I, I think they really like. They they like his intensity. Um, they like the passion with which he plays. Then, of course, there's all the things that Sean talked about is kind of that new age forward who in college is he'll probably be best playing as kind of a four um, that grows into or evolves into a three at the next level. Um, but you're talking about a, a really special talent with, with his height, with his athleticism, with his intensity, and then with his ability to kind of score from all over the floor. When you add all that up together, you know, that's why you get a player uh, with the number four ranking in the class. So that's what UNC is attracted to. Now, you know, getting that type of player, um, UNC hasn't necessarily waded into those waters a ton recently. They, they've had more of the, uh, I would call it more of almost like a, a guy who's a four who can play some five as well versus, you know, guys who are fours or guys who are fours who can play some three from time to time. Um, so more in the Brady Manic mold of the combo forward or hybrid forward than kind of the Caleb Wilson, I hate to say it, Jason Tatum, Brandon Ingram type uh, combo forward. So it would be a, a big win for them and, and a, a different type of player that they really haven't signed in, in some time, I'd say. Um, he's scheduled to unofficially visit on uh, November 11th. And the unofficial is important. Um, been talking to some people and got more clarity on the official visit situation, which I didn't fully understand with the changes that were made. So basically the, the overview is you can take official visits to as many schools as you want, starting uh, August 1st of your junior year. However, you can only take one official visit to each school ever. So hmm. UNC and other schools have to kind of be strategic in how they decide to um, offer up those official visits because if say Caleb Wilson wants to decide uh, you know, Feb I don't know when he wants to decide, but say he wants to decide in March of his senior year. Well, if he took an official visit to you in October of his junior year, that's kind of going to be, you know, out of his mind. Yeah. Things will have changed. So, but then also, if there's a player who wants to commit in October of the junior year, you can't really push it off much longer. So you, there's going to be, it, it brings a new level of gamesmanship, I would say, to the official visit process. And I think that's why you haven't seen as many official visits scheduled with UNC in this 2025 class. Now, has the NCAA changed the ruling as to how many uh, official visits um, the schools are allowed to have? Uh, have they? I guess what I'm asking is they've, they've kind of taken the reins of how many the players can take and the prospects can take themselves. But has, have they changed how many that schools can host? You know, I don't know that answer. I will find out and, and we'll get back with you. Um, that's a good question. I would imagine um, they probably still have a limit because you don't want, you know, schools being able to just <laughs> have un right. unlimited unofficial visits. So, um, but we'll, we'll find that answer and get back to you. Sean, you want to follow up a little bit about uh, about some Caleb Wilson's game? Yeah, I think Sh Sherelle's point about the 4-3 versus the 4-5, the 5-4, five, five, uh, obviously UNC has done well in that 4-5 mode. Um, I think Wilson definitely slots, at least right now, into the 4-3, four, four, 190 90 pounds. There were some situations where he had to guard a big in the EYBL, and uh, he definitely got bodied around a little bit down low, obviously, with with the time frame before he gets to college. Has that to add strength, uh, but just given where he was playing offensively and defensively, definitely prefers being on that on that perimeter, uh, being able to use close to a 6'11 wingspan, uh, you know, to for – on the perimeter for lengthwise, getting deflections, um, as well as off ball, on ball, blocking shots on drives. But um, I, I think he, he definitely will enjoy, you know, enjoys that four three spot a little bit more. And defensively, he's not, I'd say, quick enough to guard the top tier wings right now. Uh, but with the length that he does have, he can he can challenge things and make them make them interesting. And one of the slides in the video had him guarding drake powell on the top of the key powell attacked left and, and had him with a, a step or two but he was able to recover and was able to get a, a piece of the shot so i think that just shows what he's able to do right now and and what he can potentially do you know going forward that recovery and timing is is a really i guess unheralded stat or unheralded, excuse me, not stat unheralded ability uh, that, you know, some of the best players, Danny Green reminds me of that. I mean, granted, he's not as big as Caleb Wilson was. Danny Green's ability to to time uh, a shot even after he may have been beaten 
by moving his feet was was next level. Um, so while we're sticking with recruiting, Trail, uh, we've got another name that popped up on uh, on UNC's radar. Do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, about Jasper Johnson, uh, number nine kid in the 2025 class, six four con guard out of Kentucky, but recently enrolled at the uh, the quite familiar Link Academy uh, in Branson, Missouri. Uh, tell us a little bit about Mr. Johnson. Well, he's going to be in Branson, Missouri for the next year, so he will be focused on absolutely basketball and nothing else. <laughs> Um, that we know for sure. Uh, no, but uh, I think the thing with him is, uh, you know, there's always players that UNC is interested in that we just don't quite know about. But obviously, you're like, well, he's a top 10 guy. North Carolina should be interested. But there weren't a lot of tea leaves with this one. Um, we knew that eventually they would get up to link. Uh, we thought that maybe the other guard on the team, Aaron Rowe, would be someone that they would look at as maybe an option uh, for the 2025 backcourt. We don't know that they're not. But um, Johnson wasn't the offer we were expecting, I would say, from that trip to Link. Um, it's funny because, you know, James Brown, UNC's 2024 commitment, former uh, podcast uh, guest or multiple time podcast guest, actually, I believe, <clears throat> um, is there. And so, you know, it, inside baseball, you know, I'm on my day job and I see James Brown like calling me and I'm like, huh, haven't heard from him in a while. wonder if everything's OK. What's going on? So I pick up the phone. He's like, hey, man, Jasper Johnson, next UNC commit. I was like, what? He was like, he just got the <laughs> offer. He just got the offer. I was like, what, what are you talking about? He's like, you know, Coach Davis just left here. Jasper Johnson, he's, I'm telling you, you want, he, you want to talk to him right now? I was like, yeah, I'd love to talk to him right now. So <laughs> I, love the, I love the enthusiasm of the kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, he, like, he's already recruiting him hard, and he's talking about the offer. So I, I wanted to give James a shout-out because, I mean, we had a story up within – 10 minutes of the kid off, you know, announcing um, that he'd been offered by UNC because James Brown called us because, you know, we got a good relationship. So anyway, coming, um, coming for the job. Yeah, no, I, know, I, was, I, I know. I was, I was going to say, you know, it was Sherelle's, Sherelle's Rolodex and his, his source web is legendary, but I just want to put this out there. again. Top 100 recruits are calling Sherelle with like, Hey, such and such just happened like in the middle of the day. So, I mean, that, that speaks to just your reputation with some of these guys, man. K kudos to you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we were thankful for James for that. And then talking to Jasper, I think the, the main things that came to mind is that UNC is in this recruitment. This isn't one of those, what I call vanity offers, just offers to make a guy feel good. Um, I think they, you know, they're in there with some of the other top schools who are recruiting him. Obviously he's from Kentucky. We asked him about it. He said, of course, he grew up near Lexington and, you know, everybody loves Kentucky, but he really believes and was really trying to be honest that he's open and that he's, he's open to other schools. So he's taken one official visit that was to West Virginia this past weekend. Right now, there's nothing else on the schedule. Um, we'll, we'll find out something soon. He said he hoped to visit UNC. So we'll see. And in the coming days, we're, we're trying to um, put, a, put together a little report, just more about him, the person, more about him and his game. Uh, combo guard, I, I think the biggest thing and I'll let Sean go into the rest of it. The biggest thing that when I talk to people, I talk to uh, Brandon Jenkins, who's um, 24 seven sports national recruiting analyst. And I said, what do you like most about him? And he said his confidence. And I thought that said a lot because it's familiar. Yeah. You know, usually it's like, oh, he can shoot or he can rebound. But when you say confidence, that just speaks to he's probably good at a little bit of everything. But then also, you know, the super confidence comes through. So. Um, Sean, I want you to tell me a little about his game. Drill left the door open for you there, so I'll let you walk right on. In. Well, I think that that description fits pretty pretty perfectly in terms of just being able to watch him combo guard. I, I definitely more focused on scoring, I'd say, than uh, distributing as a true lead guard. Left handed, um, I think a, a good shooter from from deep. Shot around thirty six percent in EYBL, but going back to the same thing as Caleb Wilson on on just catch and shoot opportunities was up closer to 45%. So definitely, um, you know, strong from the outside, but has a pretty, pretty strong handle as well, where he can, he can definitely put some moves, freeze a defender, uh, get him off balance. Uh, definitely loves to attack left hand, uh, his, his strong hand. He can go right. But um, I think unlike Caleb, where it was the opposite, he, he's going to, he prefer to go left and finish with that left hand right now. But um yeah, I think a pretty uh, pretty unique unique guard, uh, and will be interesting to watch him watch him grow, especially at Lincoln Academy, coming from 
a smaller school in Kentucky where he, where he did really well freshman, sophomore year, uh, and then playing on the 17 year old EYBL circuit. Uh, so I think, yeah, Sherrill mentioned Kentucky, his dad played football, at Kentucky. So I think that one will, will certainly be interesting. Do they really prioritize him? Um, and then at the same time, how does he do at, at Link Academy in terms of just that, uh, general progression that you would expect somebody to make, um, you know, playing basketball at a school like that versus a, a traditional high school. And the, the link backcourt, as we talked about, is loaded. I mean, it's <laughs> it's pretty much a college backcourt. So he, he'll definitely have the opportunity to go against really good players and practice. And now moving on to the folks who are sitting here saying, hey, what about the 2024 guys? Well, funny you should ask. Uh, as of now, North Carolina is no longer recruiting anyone in the 2024 class. Sherelle, the update there is? Uh, so for some time, we've had questions about exactly how much UNC is recruiting Boogie Flan, and I think it dates back really into the summer. Uh, they went to one of PSA Cardinals, his AAU team's games um, back in July, and I'm not even sure it was for him, Not a, you know, looking back um, and talking to people around him, talking to people around Carolina. There's just been really no communication between the two parties for some time. And he made it official uh, this past weekend, cutting his list to three down to Indiana, Alabama, and Kentucky. So, um, you know, UNC has moved on. You know, some people will wonder why. Don't have that answer right now, trying to find out. Uh, but for some time, UNC hasn't really been in his recruitment. And right now, we don't have evidence of UNC actively recruiting anyone in the class of 2024 they seem to have fully moved on to 2025 you know someone could pop up obviously later on in the year someone could get released from their national letter of intent there's a whole bunch of ways for high school players to end up in new places but it seems that if there are holes and there likely will be that they are looking more at the transfer portal for those holes as opposed to the 2024 class you know you mentioned uh indiana alabama and kentucky I, I actually saw that he had released a, a top four, uh, the fourth one being Johnny T-shirt. Um, maybe, I, maybe I misread, but uh, – and actually, that probably sounds like fake news because you and I both know if Johnny T-shirt was on that list, that's where he would have committed. Uh, Johnny T-shirt sponsors this show of Inside Carolina and, and all the content that we put out here. We're very, very grateful for the partnership. Right there on East Franklin Street in Chapel Hill, it's October 1st. Go get your new basketball gear. If you have not, you have time. Take it easy. Live action with you with Carolina basketball be here soon. You come in town for that, stop by. You're in town for a football game. There's three home football games in October. You've got your chances to go buy Johnny T-shirt. Premium IC subscribers know you get that extra 10% off the top. Hit them up. Go see them. We appreciate all they do for us. We want you to appreciate them as well because they'll appreciate you. I mean, it's a nice little, you know, nice little circle and how that works. Yeah. You know? Up and down and around in a circle, circular, feeling the flow, working it. Take a break. Let the national guys run some ads. We'll be right back to talk a little schedule rundown for Carolina basketball. You're listening to the Coast to Coast podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. All right, fellas. Thanks for being around tonight. Thanks to everybody who's listening and or watching. Uh, we appreciate you. If you have not, please subscribe. Uh, you know you like this content. We want to make sure you get it immediately delivered to wherever it is that you consume podcasts, whether it's YouTube or Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever. However you get a hold of us, we want to get that automatically sent to your devices. So go ahead and subscribe if you haven't. Uh, if you don't like what you're hearing, let us know. We want to be. Um, we will actually do. Uh, we'll actually do some. Um, you know, some adjustments and some some reads if if we get some negative feedback, and we'll try to. Uh, Try to make sure you're getting what you expect, uh, the high-quality content that, that you're used to getting from inside Carolina. Boys, let's look at a schedule, shall we? Uh, the Tar Heels, as we mentioned, start doing basketball things. They've already started practicing. They've got real basketball things coming up. We mentioned prior to the break, uh, they will have their uh, – was it live action with Carolina basketball? I'll just said it before the break. I don't know. I can't remember. Got that coming up. And then they'll have their – Secret, but not so secret, but double probation, but maybe we can talk about it, but maybe not. Uh, scrimmage with uh, FAU. Uh, you may remember um, remember FAU from the Final Four last year. Uh, so there will be that coming up. And then, fellas, we got an exhibition against uh, St. Augs. Uh, St. Augustine's, or St. Augustine's, depending on which part of uh, North Carolina you're from, 
uh, will play in the Smith Center. I love that Hubert Davis does that with uh, HBCU, specifically ones that are close to home. Um, is there any reason for us to talk about that exhibition? Yeah, no. Trail says no. Sean says no. I love that. I love consensus from you guys. You're, you're really primed for our edition of No Cap or Sus later on because you're already agreeing. It's great. Um, so first couple of games, and uh, this is, you can tell these are early season games too because of the times. You've got Lehigh on November 12th at home, uh, and then you've got UC Riverside on November 17th. Uh, it's a Friday evening. Sean, I'm going to ask you, do you know anything about Riverside Ball? <laughs> um. They, they do have a good coach. I've, I've not been, uh, you know, trying to get from L.A. to Riverside for a, a, a game. Is, <laughs> it might as well be going to uh, North Carolina to, to D.C. Um, so, you know, I, I was hoping that there might be a return trip out to California next year uh, be, be with, with Maui. But um, not not too much. Good coach. But uh, you'll, you'll have to come back to me closer to the to the game time on Riverside. No worries. I love that you already made it about you because of uh, the difficulties there and then wanting the return game. I love that. I would also be the same way. I'm not judging at all. Um, Sherelle, I don't know that I ever remember UNC playing Riverside. Am I missing something? Uh, I can't recall. I'm sure they did at some point in like 1972 or something, but not in not in recent years. I can't yeah. recall. Um, so it's so. a random program. All right. So yeah. then we the Tar Heels get real, like, real tough real quick. Uh, they'll be playing at the Battle for Atlantis uh, in the Bahamas. Uh, Tommy Ashley always talked about his fond memories of, of going down there and watch the team play. Uh, and it seems like it's a really fun trip, probably second only to Maui. Uh, and God knows if that's ever going to come back. Um, first game, they're playing uh, against Northern Iowa. Last time the, the Tarles played Northern Iowa, did, did they? Is that the one where Marcus Page, the, the fighting Marcus Page, is lost in what was his homecoming game? Or have that was they played great. since then? That, uh, you know, I don't know. I thought that was, that was the last so one. Was, that was the day that the football team clinched the ACC Coastal at Blacksburg. And I remember everybody was on the moon. We were walking back to the cars, you know, the parking lot after that game and looking on our phones. And, yeah, the uh, the, the fighting Marcus Pages were beating actual Marcus Pages in basketball. Um, anything you remember about Northern Iowa? And do we expect this to be, you know, just a, hey, do your thing, Target, let's move on game, Sean? Well, no, I, I definitely wouldn't consider it at that. I mean, especially coming off of off of last season, and you know, even that the Portland game, uh, you know, before the the downfall began last year. Um, you know, Northern Iowa, Ben Jacobson, he's been he's been there for forever. Um, you know, I think for almost 15, 15 plus years. Uh, they didn't have a great season last year. I feel traditionally you know them playing in the MVC, playing in the tournament, uh, you know, going going back a few years, getting into that that second round. But um I think this one will be a slow, slow game, ugly game, and it'll be a good good test, but definitely not one that UNC fans should should count on. Uh, but a game that they will be heavily favored in and that should be a win. Uh, but I think hopefully last <laughs> last season made a made it clear that, you know, no game should be taken for granted. Yeah, and this is one of the things too where I, I don't think it's going to be hard for Hubert Davis and his staff to to motivate these guys to recognize, you know, what letting early season games get you can do for you for the rest of the year. I don't think that's going to be difficult at all. Cheryl, then, uh, so that that game against uh, against Northern Iowa will be on Wednesday, November the twenty second. They'll turn around and play in, uh, the next night uh, against Villanova or Texas Tech. Again, two teams that. Um, you depend on who you talk to have a chance to really do some things. Do you have any thoughts about either one of those squads? Oh, well, let me jump back a little bit uh, on the opening games and up to Northern Iowa. Like one thing in the two years of Hubert Davis that we haven't seen maybe uh, outside of like the Citadel game is them just really just destroying uh, a, a team oh. less talented than them. It, it always yeah. feels like it's kind of a struggle or they're up, you know, they, they are up by eight at halftime then they push it to 18 to feel comfortable. But there's never just like that second gear where they go in and just annihilate someone by 40 or 50. Again, out really outside of, you know, the Citadel. They've done it some in handful, conference. Yeah. Yeah. But in those those games kind of leading up to these tournaments, they haven't done it. So that's another sign of, of growth personally that I'm looking for is that some of these overmatched teams like beat them, not just coast to a 17 or 18 point win, but really drive home the point that you're the more gifted team, as, as Coach Williams was fond of saying. We'll, we'll um, stay here. Stay, hang on, okay. stay here. 
you know, we talked about like that was something that was a real hallmark of Dean Smith and Roy Williams teams is like they would absolutely pants teams that they were that they were, you know, more gifted than to, to use your quote of Roy Williams there. Um, I think also something that that obviously we're in tune to and I think most IC subscribers are going to be keen on is is usage and deployment of the bench. And those are the games where you get a chance to build bench minutes for guys that may not otherwise see the court uh, during conference season. Am I am I stretching things and, and, and saying that if we don't see the players in these games that we're not going to see them we're right back to where we were the last couple of years? Well, it's chicken and egg, right? They didn't blow out the Absolutely. teams. So if you don't blow out the teams, you have to make sure you win. So you got to keep your best players in for longer. So I, I think it all works together. We'll see. It, it could just be that Hubert Davis wants to play six and a half people. That that just could be it. But I still don't think we really are at the point of knowing that yet. Um, and the other thing is like there's five days or but the first four games, each one is either five or six days in between. So there's no worry about playing back to back or any of that stuff. So I think we'll have a good read on kind of the bench usage really in those first four games, because, you know, if they're up 25 and Armando Bacot is still in the game on the four timeout, then maybe that's a sign that, you know, the bench is not going to get played much. And that's just how he is. But if they're up 25 and Armando Bacot is out at the, you know, right before the, the under eight, then maybe it's the situation where he's trying to build that depth. But I just don't think we have the answer yet. By the way, I neglected to mention they do play a rad for November the 6th. That's the first official uh, regular season game. It's a Monday night. Uh, you know, who who wouldn't? Uh, absolutely. Who who in their right mind would forget a Monday night home opener against Bradford? Um, I, I think I just got so distracted by Lehigh. Shout out to Duke. Um, all right. To Sherelle. Villanova, Texas Tech, um, Paradise Island, Bahamas. If you're feeling either, either one of those teams, do, do you feel like they might be bringing some stuff back? And, and are we looking at... You know, this is already a potential early season pitfall for the Tar Heels. I mean, Villanova is kind of loaded with everybody they brought back and what they got in the portal. So I still think the jury is out on, on coach Neptune, whether or not he's, you know, a, a really good coach. That's a question people will want to answer to in his second year. Um, you know, Texas tech, I, I can't say that I know much about them other than Curran Walton's on the roster. So maybe there's a revenge factor there if they were to play them. Um, but if it is Villanova, that's going to be a tough game, and that's going to be a really good test early on in the season. Um, North Carolina typically, you know, has one of those games early on in the year where it just nothing works correctly. Um, so it'd be it'd be different for for this year's team, you know, if they came out of the battle for Atlantis, you know, either winning it or, or finishing second or something like that. Um, so if, if it is Villanova, that that is a tough test for UNC with some guys that, you know, we thought at one point might end up on the UNC roster. So uh, that should be a fun one if it happens. And and, and yeah. if I remember correctly, too, uh, sorry, Sean, if I remember correctly, too, I think Villanova's got some old dudes, which, you know, we would think North Carolina is going to be basically one of the older players in, in America. But, I mean, you know, just, just looking at Villanova's roster, Justin Moore, DJ Bamba, uh, Kim Hart, transfer from Maryland, Tyler Burt and the transfer from Richmond and Eric Dixon, Eric Dixon. I mean, I feel like they've got some some old dudes too. Sean, am I right there? Yeah, I think I think that that potential matchup would be pretty much the, the championship in terms of the best two best two teams in the in the tournament. Uh, obviously, Villanova had a disappointing year last year, lost Cam Whitmore, but I think Eric Dixon versus Baycott both have been around forever. Um, Dixon gives up some size, but su super strong. Uh, so I think that would he present some challenges to to Armando in certain ways but also seeing how Armando adapted to that and yeah they they added a lot uh from the transfer portal um probably one of the better halls of the transfer portal just given i think some of the struggles Villanova's seen on the recruiting mm -hmm. front um not to mention Mark Armstrong who was highly touted coming in didn't really do much last year but could potentially take that freshman and sophomore year leap so that could be a really good game if uh if it if it happened and so then uh where the you know, regardless of, of how the Tar Heels will fare they will play um a game against on friday the 24th either arkansas memphis michigan or stanford uh, i think michigan stanford uh, and i'm not sure how memphis is projected in the preseason um but i think uh i think arkansas most folks would think would be would be the leader there uh sean you have a you, you have a read on that? 
others on that uh, matchup if it were to be North Carolina against uh, against somebody like Arkansas? Yeah, I think you can probably count uh, Michigan and Stanford out from uh, from making it that far. Uh, I think most likely it would be would be Arkansas, uh, Memphis. You know, if they if they get hot, they're going to have some athleticism, so they could they could uh, definitely make it make it that far. But I would say Arkansas, Memphis will be the that'll be the matchup going into the championship. All right. Well, if that is indeed the, the the draw there, the Tar Heels would play back-to-back SEC opponents because they will come back home to Chapel Hill November the 29th and play that very next Wednesday. Rick Barnes and his Tennessee Volunteers. And, man, that's uh, – I, I hate to say this, but Tennessee has been fun to watch of late. And I, I think that, um, yeah, everybody knows Rick Barnes' history with uh, with Dean Smith. He and, and Roy Williams were obviously – uh, friends, depending on who you talk to, but um, and that Tennessee, there most people have them preseason top ten. Um, Sherell, will this be the the time we finally see Jonas Adu in the Smith Center? Yeah, I I think we definitely will, and it, it's going to be a good matchup. Uh, he really last year towards the, I would say the end of the season, and especially in that game against Duke, came up strong for for Tennessee in the tournament. Um, you know, they, they bring him back. Uh, Viscovi is back. Uh, Josiah Jordan James is back. Um, so they've, they've got a lot of talent. And then, um, you know, Freddie DeLone is a guard um, who, you know, I, I'm not sure exactly how he is in the rotation. Obviously, practice hasn't started and stuff. Um, from Fayetteville, uh, who played at Word of God, who uh, played for Garner Road, who really kind of came on strong um, over the summer. I, I, again, I, I haven't kept up with him. Um, but a lot of people have really strong opinions on him and, and think he's going to be a really good player. So they, they have talent. They have experienced talent. And as you know, you know, I know Hubert Davis isn't Roy Williams, but Rick Barnes gave Roy Williams all kinds of fits, um, mm-hmm. you know, at Tennessee, regardless of where they played. At, yeah. Texas, Tennessee, Clemson, wherever he, he's given uh, fits to, to Roy Williams. So even though Roy Williams has a good record against them. So I think it's something to watch. It's a talented team coming to the Smith Center, but you would think that North Carolina being home, um, that should help a ton um, with, with Tennessee coming in. I can't believe you failed to mention portal superstar Dalton Necht. <laughs> yeah, you know, another player that North Carolina talked to and just didn't really go anywhere. But um, I want to see his jump up in competition because, you know, going from – Northern Colorado to the SEC is is a big jump, and, and the question would have been similar at UNC too. But um, he's a guy who can shoot; he's super athletic. So, uh, yeah, a, a lot of pieces that have to fit. Just like really every school, honestly. Yeah. I, I think the games in the beginning of the year are going to be pretty ragged, not just Carolina, Absolute crap around the country, yeah. because there's just so many new parts for everyone. Um, and and this is a new phenomenon. Really, it's only the second year of this kind of portal movement, so people still. I don't think are, are used to incorporating portal guys and freshmen and guys with a different role this year all at once against good teams. Like that's hard to do. Yeah. Well, and, and a couple of days later, you know, the Tar Heels will open up ACC play against Florida state. Uh, not really sure how to read them, but that is the first conference game of the year. And of course, you know, why wouldn't you be playing conference opponents in December? Uh, but then, all right, let's, so let's hear this out. UNC goes from playing Atlantis, where they will face either Villanova or Texas Tech, so potentially Villanova, then Arkansas, home against Tennessee, who is a preseason top 10 team uh, and Elite Eight squad from last year, uh, and then home against Florida State. They get a little bit of a break. Oh, wait, it's a conference game. Then they travel to New York to play Connecticut in the Jimmy V Classic. And Man, you can say what you want to about uh, uh, about other schools scheduling. You cannot knock Hubert Davis for for playing the, the the top of the top. They'll play UConn, and then they'll play um, in two weeks after that, December the 16th, in Atlanta against Kentucky. Sean, what does it mean for Hubert Davis and his staff to have like all of these big potential pitfalls early in the season? Uh, and I don't even say potential pitfalls. Let's take that. That sounds really negative. What do you see in knowing that North Carolina is going against like all of the Blue Buds, all of the hot – you know, up and coming new talented schools and a lot of schools that had great success last season. Well, I think that November 22nd through December 16th timeframe, that can either be, ex- you know, extremely long and painful for all the UNC fans, or, you know, it can be a pretty exciting time. Cause that, that, I mean, looking at that schedule and then relooking at it, that, that's a lot of 
good teams, a lot of competition. You know, I, I think everybody has last Thanksgiving through December, um, you know, fresh in their minds of how that pretty much turned the season on its head. Um, and, and I think this year, in terms of your question, I think it's, you know, it is great that UNC is going to be playing these primetime matchups and uh, UNC's get, you know, defending champs, UConn, UNC Kentucky with all the, all the five-star freshmen, top, top guys are bringing in, um, not to mention Atlanta. So I think it's, you know, it's, a, it's nice that they got Tennessee at home and Florida state at home. Obviously Tennessee is going to be a challenge, but, um, it's going to very challenging time, but at the same time, it's good to have UNC playing some of these premier games. Cause I think you get so used to seeing the, the Duke, Michigan, Kentucky, Kansas, uh, you know, that, that going on, um, those, those games getting the headline, which of course it will, but, you know, they're playing the Jimmy V classic, which UNC, um, hasn't done for, for quite some time and then Kentucky as well. So um, <laughs> I, it'll, it'll be interesting once we get a little closer and we start going through, through records and what we think wins and losses will be, <laughs> but um, you know, they're, they're, they're going to have to hit the ground running and, and get everybody acclimated because you know, th- there's a few games to, to get everybody, everybody going in, yep. in November at home. But at the same time, you also need to hopefully be, seeing what you have from your bench because then you're going right into it. And we've seen how that's gone the last, last two years. And North Carolina will head to Charlotte to play in the, I want some swag Sherelle McMillan jump in invitational against Oklahoma. Uh, this is the, this is the third this is the third year, right? Is this the second year? I can't remember. I know they played Michigan. Did they play Florida? Second year. Okay. Um, so they'll be playing Oklahoma spectrum center. Sherelle, I'm sure you will be uh, up front and center for that game on December the 20th. That's a Wednesday night. Am I correct? All right, you're shaking your head. This is a, this is sometimes an auditory medium. So you know, you can... yes, I, I will be in attendance. Uh, <laughs> I'm, say... I'm, I'm assuming they just give you give you swag when you walk in because you're Sherelle McMillan. It, it would be nice. I would have really appreciated. It. I was walking through last year, just trying to eat up everything. Um, but to to Sean's point, like that stretch, man, they play five games essentially from Black Friday through almost the end of the year. Five games between. Um, November 20, five games between November 24th and Christmas. And I mean, it's just, that's a lot of time in between games to kind of stew or celebrate, depending mm-hmm. on what happens to Sean's point. So it, it is a stretch that really could right, tell us a bunch about what the season's going to look like. I think last year, you know, once those, was it three consecutive losses or four? Once that happened um, yeah. out, out in Portland, we kind of knew like, oh, this, this, is, this team's in trouble. So yeah. on on the opposite side, if they were to go three and one in that stretch or something like that, I think the the fan base and, and the team would have a, a much better feel um, heading into the rest of conference play and you know their game with Charleston Southern on the 29th. All right. Well, um, you're leading us there. Last game of the of the calendar year will be a Friday night uh, against Charleston Southern, which is again that's what everybody thinks. They think college basketball Friday night hosting Charleston Southern in Chapel Hill. Uh, calendar flips over. Tar Heels go to Pittsburgh for a Tuesday night, 7 p.m. tip. Uh, they'll come home that weekend on Saturday uh, to to host Clemson. Uh, I'm sorry, that's at Clemson. They're not coming home. They're going to Clemson. Uh, I love that the schedule now says that game will be on ESPN2, but they have no time you know, allotted for it. They have no idea what time the game's going to be. It'll be Saturday, January the 6th. Uh, and then they play on the road again at NC State. So that's three conference road games after the early December home tilt against Florida State. So UNC opens up with one home and then three straight conference road games. Um, uh, you know, the the third one being Wednesday, January the 10th at NC State. Um, you know, that'll be spicy, 8 o'clock uh, Wednesday night in Raleigh. Um, that one will also be on ESPN. Then they come home. I know I, I had faked you a minute ago. Then they come home that Saturday to host Syracuse, uh, 1 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon, and everybody will love to go to that game. Guys, uh, any any trepidation about those three games to open the season on the road uh, and then coming home to play Syracuse, or, or do we feel good about that, Sean? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's ideal opening three straight games on the road, especially at Pittsburgh, uh, a team that's just dominated them lately. Uh, but I think, once again, those three games will, will I'd say, not determine, but really show how they're going to play in, in ACC play because – all three of those teams will be able to give them trouble all three of those places, um, especially Pittsburgh and Clemson. They've 
they've struggled or played to the competition um, in, in years past. So I think if they can come out with some wins or take care of business, we can know that, hey, this is a different team than last year who looked like the better team for yeah, probably 70 Seventy-five percent, if not more, of the those games, and then gave it away at the end. So mm. it'll be tough, but if they're going to be a top, you know, what, what, fifteen, ten team, yeah, with that senior experience, they'll they'll need to come through instead of giving them away. If yeah. anything else, I'm sorry, go ahead, Trill. No, I was going to say to Sean's point, this is where you would expect all that experience from all the guys on the roster, the, the fourth and fifth and sixth year guys. You would expect it if it's going to come out in a stretch like that where they have three straight road games. Um, so uh, I, I guess that would be Hubert Davis, Hubert Davis and his staff's hope um, is that the leadership on the team who has been through almost every environment that you can be through, you know, go through, um, will, will kind of show them, show the younger, the younger guys, the ropes and, and get them through. Well, even without that, the young guys, after what they will see before Christmas should absolutely be toughened up and, and have a little bit of calluses on their skin from, from those early tilts that they have. Uh, Targets will then uh, play Louisville on a Wednesday night at 9 o'clock uh, in Chapel Hill. It's January the 17th. Louisville, as we all know, was a, a, a tire fire in a dumpster last year, so it was a dumpster tire fire. Uh, no idea what to expect from them, but uh, that could be the the first welcome back for, for Jalen Withers, who, of course, transferred from uh, Louisville to North Carolina. Boston College at Chestnut Hill on a Saturday afternoon. Boston College is such a weird place to play. Chestnut Hill is such a weird place to play. Uh, you like to think on Saturday afternoon it's probably going to sound a little bit like a, uh, a little bit like a, a library. Uh, Cheryl, does that feel like one of those games where UNC sleepwalks through the first half because it's you know, um, it, it's a random Saturday in the conference season and there's no real energy and they have to burn their own. I, you know, in that situation, I found that they've done really a, a pretty decent job of putting Boston College away. Um, so even. Hubert Davis's first team, I think, went up there and just kind of blew them out. Uh, I think it was the I know as the COVID year, excuse me. I think the COVID year might have been the last time they were there, and they, they won by thirty five or forty. It was one of the, the better games of that season. Uh, so I think I I don't want to say anything's a must win or anything, but that four game stretch right there, with what they have coming up in the second half of ACC play, like that needs to be a four and zero stretch. Three home games in at BC. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't again. Don't want to call it must win, but that that needs to be a four and zero stretch for them. I think to really reach the goals they want to reach. Well, and also, I mean, there's something you got to think about. That is that is as marquee a matchup as you get on a Saturday afternoon at Boston College on the CW. Like when when I think of when I think of the back of road and classic knockdown drag out UNC ACC tilts. That's what I think of. Right, Sean uh, Tar Heels will then go on the the dreaded. Saturday to Monday run. Uh, they will play Monday night. Uh, they'll host, thankfully, so they they won't have both games on the road. But they'll host uh, Wake Forest. Uh, do you have a sense as, as to where Wake Forest might be going this year? They, they, they've been such a weird team to follow. Uh, well, I, I think one be, before the the Boston College game, always always a smart move taking UNC in the points in Boston. That's tended to work <laughs> out work out well in the past. Uh, and, and I think if you're going to do a Saturday, Monday, till you can ask for better at Boston College and coming coming home against Wake Forest before going back on the road. Wake will be, you know, they they, they lost a lot. They're in the news, uh, but they've done tremendously well in the transfer portal the last two years. And you know, I was pretty high on Hunter Salas as a guy coming out of out of high school. So, given the track record of what they've done, I'm excited to see how he does at at uh, at Wake this year. So. Uh, if it was at Wake, it might be a little different, but I think that show, that one should fall into the win column for UNC. After that, Tar Heels will go on the road Saturday at Tallahassee for their second of two against Florida State, and then on the road uh, that Tuesday against Atlanta. Feels like one of those games where the Tar Heels might just stay gone instead of down and back, down and back. Um, then they come home February the 3rd trail to host Duke Saturday night, 6.30, on the ACC network, as we know, Duke has, you know, nine of the top five incoming freshmen on their roster. Uh, very heralded, should be a very talented team. Uh, brought a lot, you know, brought quite a few back from from last year's team that I think really started finding their groove late in the season. Um, are are there enough? Are there right here as we sit, as we sit in October, Cheryl? Are there enough cliches for you to use uh, to preview that game? 
Uh, no, there's not enough. Uh, we, we could take some time, but I, I mean, Duke's a talented team, man. There's no way around it. For and sure. it, this is the first time in a while, I think, that they've had someone like Filipowski come back, uh, a player as impactful and as good. And frankly, last year at times as dominant as him. And, you know, I'm not even, he, he's might not even be the most talented player on the team because Tyrese mm-hmm. Proctor also came on towards the end of the year. And you talk about a guy, you know, six, five, and just has a, a world of skills that are still developing. Um, and that's not to mention guys like Mark Mitchell and, and uh, Roach, who's back as a senior. Um, so there's a ton of talent, a ton of incoming talent. I think, as always, um, it's about how you mix it together, um, how you define roles, because um, it's, it's tough when you have, I mean, they have 11 guys who I think really probably believe, or probably, probably 12 guys who really believe they should be getting, you know, a lot of minutes and playing a lot of time. So it, it's it's a good problem to have if you're John Shire, but it, it is also tough managing those personalities. I think as Hubert Davis saw last year and managing, you know, minutes and, and all the stuff that comes along with probably uh, potentially a preseason number one ranking, likely a preseason number one ranking. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of alphas. Um, follow that up, Tar Heels will uh, stay home again, play Clemson on February the 6th. Uh, you know, Clemson and Chapel Hill used to be a thing. Um, uh, I'm sure I'm probably still ripping some some scabs off by mentioning that. Then they go on the road on the 10th at Miami. Again, Miami's got a lot of, uh, a lot of mojo coming into the season. I think most folks anticipate that Miami, after – you know, making the Final Four last year will probably be a top 20, top 15-ish team. Um, we'll know a lot more in February when they play them. Uh, Tars will then go on the road for their second one at Syracuse uh, and then back home against Virginia Tech and then Virginia. Uh, so, I mean, that's that's a weird a weird little stretch there. You've got Duke, but that's, you know, it's just, this is the meat of the conference season. Duke, home against Clemson, road Miami, road Syracuse, and then Virginia Tech, Virginia. Sean, is that, it, do you feel like that's the stretch where – You'll probably start seeing some guys. Um, I, I don't want to say get hurt, but where you'll start seeing the 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 wear of a conference season start showing up on some players and guys hitting a wall, and, and you know maybe if there's some friendly, like, think about how Seth Trimble was doing last year. Then all of a sudden you kind of got into that place in conference play, and he just um, his playing time went away. He started struggling with his shot. Is this the place where that's most likely to happen? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're you're a full month into. Conference play, uh, Feb- you know, February, that's where the grind really begins. So I think it'll be important, hopefully, where depth is established. Uh, you know, you're playing, as Sherelle mentioned, p- number one preseason team, um, Miami, that that Jim Laranega always has given UNC trouble, and then at UVA where Carolina doesn't win. Um, and, and hopefully this this could be the year that changes that. Um, so that that's a tough, tough stretch. Um, and I think that's all the more important for hopefully the ACC to do well out of conference so that these wins are counting for something versus Mm -hmm. really only one or two schools uh, like the the past two years. Yeah, and then after playing at Virginia on February the 24th, uh, UNC's last four games, three of them are at home, and then you have the road game uh, close the season at Duke. You've got Miami at home on February the 26th, 7 o'clock, it's a Monday night. Um, That Saturday, Four o'clock hosting NC State. Uh, I'm sure that will that game will sell out. And probably be a very raucous environment. Um, that t- next Tuesday, March the fifth, Tar Heels will host Notre Dame in Chapel Hill and then go to Duke on March the 9th at six thirty that Saturday night for ESPN's way to wrap the season. I mean, the first thing that jumps out at me and, and my old man dad sense is going to kick in here. One nine o'clock game, and and I am just. The the putting the kids to bed sleepy side of me is so thrilled for that. Um, anything else jump out at you guys about the schedule, Sean? No, I mean I, I think it was uh, uh, you know that that's a good point on the on the East Coast in terms of the nine p.m. But I think it's a fairly balanced overall. There are some definite tough stretches that that road stretch to start, um, yeah. and then I, I think the February stretch you mentioned, and then uh, you know they should potentially have the ability, you know, three home games to end the year before going to at Duke, which will obviously be another tough one. So it, it kind of w- will go in ways, but there's no, I'd say the, you know, the Louisville at Boston College, Wake at Florida State at Georgia Tech, that's a section where you got to, you got to collect the wins and you can't, yeah. can't have those, you know, Q3, Q4 losses, depending on how those teams are doing. So uh, it, it's, it's a, it's a tough schedule. In, in general. One of them. One of the things Mac 
Brown has been saying during football season, and you can tell he's been saying a lot because the players are now saying it when, when they're interviewed is, is stacking days. Those are games that North Carolina absolutely has to stack, um, independent of how they do at the beginning of the year. Sure. Uh, I was going to say make your layups. Like, yeah, you know, no disrespect because it is disrespect to say that team is layup. So, you know, you, you've got to make your layups during that time. Like Sean said, I think the other two things I would mention that Saturday, Monday turnaround with UVA and Miami is brutal. That is tough. I mean, because UVA, I think we'll be back to being more like UVA um, than they have been in, in the last couple of years. Uh, got a couple of good transfers in. Of course, some guys who redshirted uh, like Leon Bond, who are, are going to be really good players. And then you have Reese Beekman, who, uh, you know, I know Carolina fans don't want to hear this, was probably the best defensive player uh, in the conference last year, up him and Leakey. Um, so uh, I, I think they're back. Miami is going to be a really good team for, for those who are uh, inclined in to, into such proclivities. They would make a really good kind of stretch bet to win the ACC. Uh, but then you finish with four of six at home. So if you yeah. can, if they can just kind of make it through, you know, split those two at least. Um, and then make their layups on the way in and, and see what happens at Duke at the end. I think they can have a really respectable conference record and, and be closer to what UNC fans expect. Well, uh, in that vein, let's play a quick round of the world's most famous and appreciated sweeping the country uh, game show, No Cap or Sus. As you know, if you listen to the show, No Cap, meaning that that is a sure thing, or sus, meaning I'm not sure about that, and that is quite suspect. I will pose a statement to both Sean and Sherelle. They will say whether that is no cap or that is sus. Boys, you ready? Always. All right. All right. No cap or sus. Uh, UNC will lose five or more times before the end of 2023. Sean, hmm. no cap or sus? Oh, man. I feel, I feel like last year where we're – you know, going to go all, all no cap, which I will, I will do. <laughs> um, I think they're going to, they'll, they'll take a, a few losses, but yeah, five, you know, five before the end of the year would be pretty much in the same boat as last year. Um, so going to go under, or going to go no cap. They will not lose five games uh, by 2023. Let's well, see. I said UNC will lose five games. Uh, so what sus, you're saying sus, is that it's sus. sus. All right. Yeah. You're not used to saying sus. You've always, you've gone yeah. no cap since we started the show. Yeah. Shrill, no cap or sus. UNC will lose five or more games before the end of the year. I'm sorry. I, we have to agree again. I'm going to say that's sus. I think three or four is probably more likely. You would expect one of the UConn, uh, Kentucky games probably. But I, I think they know how important it is to, to your point, stack a couple of Q1 wins early on in the season because that changes how the computers and how everything looks at you for the rest of the season. So I, I think they'll go in with a level of importance this year that maybe they didn't have last year and and you know not lose five games before the end of the calendar year all right second one no cap or sus trail i'm coming to you this time unc will win two of the matches against tennessee kentucky or yukon so no cap or sus unc will win two of those three i'm gonna say that's us um that's that's tough man because kentucky is going to be preseason top five mm -hmm. yukon's probably going to be preseason Top five. I, I think they get Tennessee because it's at home. Um, but I, I can't I wouldn't feel comfortable saying they're gonna beat Kentucky or UConn on a neutral floor at this point. They can, obviously, but I wouldn't feel comfortable saying they will. Sean, same question. North Carolina will win two of the three against Tennessee, Kentucky, or UConn. Is that no cap or is that sus? I think this is finally the moment we disagree. I'm gonna go uh, no cap. Two and one wins against Tennessee, win uh, against UConn, lost to Kentucky. Man, listen, I was confident with this statement. I love that you had the, the two of the three already laid out there. All right, last one for this edition of the world's most famous game, no cap or sus. Sean, UNC will have less than two home losses this season. Is that no cap or is that sus? Sorry, listen, how many? Two home losses this season. Um, or I'll say two, two or less. I'm gonna go sus on that one. I, they'll, they'll have, I think they'll have more. They'll have more than that. Sherell, UNC will lose two or more home games this year. Is that no cap or is that sus? I think that's no cap. I, I think I think two is about right. Um, probably one of those games against one of the top ten type ranked teams coming to the Smith Center, and then there's usually that one game where something just doesn't work or 
somebody overslept or had a long night and it just didn't yeah. quite work. Um, so thankfully Pittsburgh isn't coming to the Smith Center this year. So that's a good thing. Oh, that's the fire everybody game that we undoubtedly get every single season that you know, and everybody loses their mind on. Um, rightfully so. That's what fans do. Uh, but guys, let's before we get out of here and do our, our two pennies, um, we're going to make our, our two cents before we leave. Uh, it's now going to be a regular segment. I know we do it most of the time, but it's not going to be a regular segment. It's going to be a regular segment because it's brought to you by Congruity. As a new sponsor here on Instant Carolina, we're so glad to have Congruity on the team. Congruity is the leading provider for Tar Heel business owners' payroll, HR, and employee benefits needs. Congruity is from North Carolina. Uh, they like to say that it's national coverage with a local presence and personal support. They're kind of the opposite of these big box guys you you hear for hear about. Um, Darren and Matt have a great team, and they will provide you personalized and local experience from right here in North Carolina. They can empower your small to mid-sized business so that you don't have to worry about your HR, your payroll, all of that nightmare stuff. Look, as a guy that, that runs an organization, I know what a nightmare that can be. Um, Congruity will get you with top-of-the-line technology so you can keep up with all of the trends that are happening. And again, you don't have to worry about it because Congruity will take care of it. And these dudes are absolutely obsessed with customer service. They will become part of your team. They'll take care of all the heavy lifting. Uh, the administrative support that, that bogs you down let them handle it. You go run your company. Let Congruity take care of this. Uh, if you'd like to, to find out more about them, visit congruityhr.com forward slash Tar Heels. You can learn more about them. Fill out a form and one of their consultants will reach out to you and they will give Inside Carolina subscribers a payroll and HR assessment for your business for free. The low, free 99. That's congruityhr.com forward slash Tar Heels. Glad to have congruity on the show. With that, give me your two cents before you get out of here today, bro. Well, I think uh, coming up uh, this this upcoming weekend in Colorado Springs is really the premier basketball event of the fall, USA Basketball. Um, both Ian Jackson and Drake Powell will be there in the 2024 class. They used to have it smaller where it'd be in one gym, uh, but they've expanded the, the fall camp, which is actually – where I first met Sherelle in person at uh, many, many years ago uh, oh. into, into, into two gyms. So they'll have the younger guys in one, the older guys in another. Um, the 2025 class, that'll probably be, be, be split by uh, birth date, but all the offered 2025 guys will be there. Uh, and then you have uh, some of the 2026 guys that I'm sure we'll start to hear about going forward. Uh, used to make it to this every year. Unfortunately, will not be there this year, but we'll be following uh, as much as I can on online. So just something to be be aware of. But you'll have the UNC guys and then all the offer guys uh, competing in probably one of the best competition spots uh, in the country. Love that. That's the great way to to throw out our first congruity sponsored two cents. Sherelle, you got two cents you want to add before you get out of here? Two cents, uh, two UNC commits officially visiting for a live action. We've confirmed that James Brown will be there um, and that Drake Powell will be there as well. We're waiting on one more confirmation. Um, read between the lines if you wish. Uh, <laughs> we haven't gotten it yet, so we can't say it. And then I would say just, you know, there probably will be other recruits there. But as uh, it gets closer, we're only about two weeks away from it. As it gets closer, uh, we'll, we'll update those. And this is our last time talking before that happens. So it'll the next time we talk, we'll have actually seen the UNC basketball team, even if it's a, a quick scrimmage, like play against each other. Man, it's hard to believe that here we sit and the next time we will talk, we will have you. We will be able to talk about everybody's freakouts, like the unnecessary reactions. Maybe we'll play a little no cap or sus with some mm -hmm. unnecessary knee jerk type reactions from from uh, live action with Carolina basketball. Fellas, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for making time for us. Um, I always love what you bring to the show. Shout out to everybody who who listened, uh, who's, who's downloaded this and who is, uh, who has checked us out. We do this for you and hope you appreciate what you're getting. Uh, we appreciate Johnny t-shirt and congruity for sponsoring and shout out to John Siegley for producing the show. But until next time, this has been the coast to coast podcast on InstaCarolina.com. for Sean Marin, for Sherelle McMillan. I'm Joey Powell. We will talk to you sometime very soon.